Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, Drafting Quality Patents, Avoiding 112 Rejections. I am Gail Martin, Associate Marketing Manager at LexisNexis IP, and I wanted to cover a couple things before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions during the conference by using the chat or Q&A feature. And we will be sending you a copy of the slides and a link to the recording from today's presentation. Now I'd like to introduce uh, today's facilitator, Jean Quinn. Jean is the founder of IPWatchdog.com, a patent attorney, law professor, and leading commentator on patent law and innovation policy. Since 2000, he has also been a principal lecturer in the PLI Patent Bar Review course. And Jean would like to introduce the other panelists who will be joining him today. So I will uh, turn it over to you now, Jean. Thanks a lot, Gail. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for being here today. We had over 600 people register for, for this webinar, and given the importance of 112 in modern patent practice, that's, um, that, that's understandable. So we're going to have a, a good conversation here today, hopefully, and um, thank you for joining us. And now just a quick word from the Shameless Commerce Division here. This webinar series that we do is made possible by our sponsors. They enable us to bring it to you for, for free. And I think we're delivering high quality content uh, to you and hopefully you find it useful. So what I ask is, is that if you are in the market for any of the services that LexisNexis provides, then I would really appreciate it if you at least would give them a test drive because they do make this possible. And the patent optimizer um, program and platform that they have here really directly addresses 112 issues, which may come up a little bit during the, during the um, webinar here today. But I think if you look at it, you will find it extremely useful. Um, and then just a word here, many of you probably already know this, we're going to be doing a webinar every Thursday this year in 2018. We will occasionally be doing a Monday webinar as well as the year progresses. And at any point in time, you can go to IP Watchdog and on the nav bar, click webinars and see our upcoming webinars and also uh, watch webinars that we have previously done uh, as well. So I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us here. One is uh, Jim Carmichael. Jim is a patent attorney and an expert witness, and he's also a former administrative patent judge at the Patent Office, and he also spent some time in the Solicitor's Office at the Patent Office, and he uh, argued one of the seminal 112 cases dealing with means plus function that we will talk about during the, the call here today. So thank you, Jim, for being with us. And also joining us is Dave Stitzel. And Dave is a former patent examiner. He is a patent attorney. He has a lot of prep and process experience. And currently, he is a consultant with LexisNexis. So thanks, guys, for being here. I really appreciate it. And let me just push to the outline here. This is something that you've all seen when you registered. So I won't read this or go through it for you. But what I'd like to do before we start is Jim and Dave, get your preliminary thoughts on 112. Now, in a nutshell, what do you want people to be thinking as we approach this material substantively? So, Jim, first to you and Dave, the same question when Jim is uh, done. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks, Gene. We're going to go into more detail on all of this, but very briefly, I would say that for 112, you want to say uh, everything you can about the invention and nothing about the prior art. Yeah, that that is certainly certainly true. The good advice to live by. Dave, um, your thoughts. Yeah, sure thing. And thanks for having me, Gene. Uh, I was just going to mention that um, you know, and we're going to get into some 112 uh, slides here momentarily. We can go into more detail, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, 112 issues are, are a real issue, especially post grant. And unfortunately, examiners are under severe time constraints, uh, just as patent practitioners are. And uh, quite honestly, it's you know, it's one of those things where it's it's not uncommon to do an analysis on a granted patent and, and come across you know what could be uh, fatal 112 errors. And, and at the end of the day, if you're going to be paying uh, you know, exorbitant legal fees and maintenance fees, uh, you know, you want the, the, the patent to be worth the paper it's written on. So there's a lot at stake, um, and I think that uh, what's at stake uh, resonates uh, well with what you said earlier as far as, uh, Gene, as far as how many attendees are, are present. So uh, that would be my, my two cents. Okay, great. Well, thanks, guys, for, for leading this off there. We already have one question about uh, CLE credit for this. 
CLE is not, we're not going to be applying for CLE credit, but what a number of people have done with these webinars, I know, is in a lot of states you can apply yourself. There's a form that you can fill out and um, you supply the information. And you'll find that through these PowerPoint slides, which are going to be made available to you after the fact, um, there's a number of links to IP Watchdog articles that specifically address the exact substance we're going to talk about today. So f please feel free to submit one or more of those articles to uh, satisfy the written materials requirement if there is one in your state. So breaking news. Now this was not something that we specifically teased before this, but there's a couple cases, three cases over the last 10 days or so that do play a bearing on uh, the specification and we wanted to at least highlight them for you if you are not aware of them. Now, Jim, Atrix Software and Berkheimer, these are software cases and we're not going to make this a software webinar, but um, they are within the last 10 days or so. What, what do you want people to, to know about these in terms of drafting? Yeah, thanks, Gene. Uh, these two cases, as well as the one that uh, is going to be on the next slide, automatic, automated tracking, are a trio of cases that the Federal Circuit has come out with in the last uh, week or so that uh, uh, really tell us a lot about what to put in a uh, patent application as far as discussing or not discussing the prior art and the prior art problem that is being solved. I'll, I'll run through these three cases real quickly uh, just because in two weeks from today we're doing another webinar uh, that uh, goes into them in more detail. The first one of the three, uh, Barkheimer, reversed a grant of summary judgment on 101 grounds, and it said that the improvements in the specification create a factual dispute about uh, whether the invention was uh, conventional and so forth. And uh, finally, uh, the courts have recognized that uh, from a 101 perspective, the question of whether something is conventional is uh, can be a question of fact. The really interesting case is the next one, the Atrix decision, because there the Federal Circuit reversed a district court uh, finding on 101 based on improvements over the prior art that were not discussed in the specification. They were simply alleged in the amended complaint. And so a litigation note here is obviously if you get a motion to dismiss under Alice, you should immediately put in an amended complaint with your Alice defense in your amended complaint, which when then needs to be taken as true. But it's very interesting because it doesn't have to be in the specification. And the third, uh, the third one of this trilogy is automatic, automated tracking. Well, hold on before and you get there. Let's, Jim. Let me just interrupt you because there's a question here on the bottom of this slide that we at least want to talk about, and I, I don't think we want to get too sidetracked with it because, as you said, we're going to um, be talking about the, the, these latest software cases on March 8th in another webinar. But in light of Atrix, should you be including the improvements? in the specification? Well, that, that's a great question, and it depends on how you do it. You, you sh in, in my view, you don't need to talk about the prior art or advantages over the prior art, but it is good to talk in a specification about uh, what you are accomplishing with your invention. So you can say that your invention is uh, doing something that, uh, in accomplishing something that you wouldn't have without the invention, but you shouldn't say that it's accomplishing something that the prior art couldn't do. Because if there's one thing we know when we are writing patent applications is that we don't know everything. We don't know what we don't know. I, I've been involved in probably 100 patent infringement litigations, and I think in perhaps every single one of them, the best prior art that was presented in the litigation was uh, not found during the prosecution stage. So you know that you don't know what the prior art is, and so it's really dangerous to talk about 
the prior art or how you are improving over the prior art because um, it's probably going to be wrong and as a result you're going to unduly limit the scope of the invention um, you, you're going to provide somebody a story to tell the jury like oh look you told the patent office that you were the first ever to do this one thing and look it turns out as it often does you weren't the first one to do this now there's still stuff in the claim that you were the first to do but it already starts off on a bad foot if you're telling like in the summary or the background that you did something that n nobody else had ever done because you don't you don't know that mm -hmm. and worst that can result in a charge of inequitable conduct from the lawyer that puts it in and from the inventor that signs the declaration saying the prior art couldn't do something because that's often turns out to not be true. Right. Yeah. And we have a question here. What is the statutory legal basis for um, the requirements uh, or discussion of requirements in a patent application? And the truth is, is everything that people say are required to be in a patent application based on the MPEP are really just suggested uh, content, correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the MPEP says that you should have a field of the invention, a background of the invention, and the summary of the invention. Sure, the PTO wants you to put that stuff in there because it makes their job easier. That doesn't mean that it's a good way to represent your clients. Those things are not required. And many people will say, well, gee, other countries require it. And I've prosecuted patents all around the world, and it's not true. None of them require it. Just like in the U.S., the uh, many foreign patent attorneys will tell me, hey, you got to have all of this stuff, and you got to discuss the prior art. And I say, oh, really? That's so interesting. Show me where in your law that's required. And then they say, oh, never mind. <laughs> and it's a, it, for some reason, it's a worldwide myth that you need to have a background, a summary, and a field of the invention discussing the prior art. You don't. Nowhere in the world is that required. Yeah, and no good deed goes unpunished, uh, right, Dave? I mean, you're a former examiner, and when we were in the green room waiting to come in here, you were talking about um, the admissions and the 103 issues. Can you just quickly lay that out for folks? Yeah, sure thing, and I completely agree with Jim. It's, it's best. I think back in the day, it used to be commonplace to talk about the uh, the background, you know, the prior art in the background, and uh, for the reasons we discussed earlier, you know, a lot of times if you have something like that in there, it is an admission that the examiner will latch on to, and, uh, you know, at that point, they're looking for, a, you know, another reference. If they can't find an anticipatory reference, uh, they'll, they'll be looking for another reference to combine with the with the art that you admitted was applicant prior uh, admitted uh, applicant admitted prior art. So, you know, it's it's one of those roadmap issues that if you discuss uh, too much uh, prior art in the background, it's going to be a roadmap for the examiner to start piecing together other references to come up with a 103. Okay. And I would and I, I would mention to rush too through oh. all of this, but I want to get yeah. to the next slide. Here, yeah, sure thing. Jim, because I. Um, because we got a, a, a ton of stuff here uh, to get through, but what do we want people to know uh, right away about automated tracking? Sure. Um, what we want to know, what we want people to know about automatic automated tracking is that this shows you the downside of uh, saying that something is conventional in your patent application. I would never want to have that word in my patent application. Uh, here's a quote from automated tracking. The specification pointedly indicates that the recited components of the claimed RFID system were conventional. And you see this a lot in patent applications, and people seem to, to think that it's, it will help for enablement to say, I'm using this off-the-shelf thing. It's well-known. You can go find it. But if it's well-known, your invention will be enabled. You don't have to say in your specification that something is well-known or conventional. And the danger of doing that is shown in this automated tracking case and in countless rejections where the patent office will take your uh, admission that something is conventional and twist it into having you supposedly saying that 
it's now conventional how you are using that technology in your combination, which obviously you don't want to you don't want to give that impression. Right. Yeah. Um, I think I think that that's that's critically important, and these are things we're going to uh, dive into more here in a couple weeks. Um, but Dave, do you have any thoughts on that before we we move on? Uh, no, that, I'm good on that. Okay. So, um, and now we're going to kind of get into the, you know, those are the three cases that you need to be aware of if you're not already aware of them. Um, and now this is where we thought we were going to begin uh, before those late-breaking cases came up, is with 112 rejections. And this is just a slide to remind everybody, you know, here are the, there's a number of types of issues that come up at the patent office in terms of errors. And there are significant disadvantages when you can fix those errors prior to filing. And Dave, I know this is a slide I adapted from your materials. You have, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so, so 112 uh, errors and issues come in many different forms. Obviously, 112 first with respect to a lack of sufficient written description. Uh, you're also looking at 112 uh, second issues when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, vague and indefinite claim language. And then, of course, uh, you know, 112 sixth paragraph uh, for functional claims where there's a lack of uh, structural support within the spec. But, you know, when you're looking at vague and indefinite, uh, that's that's, you know, a big can of worms. There's a lot of different uh, terminology that can be present within claims and, and whatnot that, that can be considered vague and indefinite uh, by an examiner during prosecution and uh, quite honestly, uh, you know, post uh, post grant, uh, you know, review, uh, whether it's at the uh, patent office or in a court of law. But uh, just as as a few examples, I think we've got some, uh, or maybe not. But uh, for example, like relative terminology. So you, you've got uh, relative terminology in terms of degree, like uh, relatively large. Uh, essentially free, things like that. Also, uh, in addition to that, uh, um, approximations. So uh, terms like essentially free, uh, about, similar, substantially pure type, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, in addition to approximations, uh, you've got subjective terms. So uh, things like aesthetically pleasing, uh, comparable, desirable, normal, uh, pleasing, superior, unobtrusive. Uh, things like that. These are these are some of the things that I, and I should mention too. Uh, some of these are pulled from the MPEP. Uh, some of them are part of the uh, supplemental examination guidelines uh, that was uh, dated back in February of 2011. Um, and then, honestly, a lot of these are just from case law that I've read over the years. But uh, in addition to uh, subjective terms, uh, you're looking at things like adjectives, uh, you know, comparative, so higher and small, uh, exemplary uh, claim language, like for example or the like. Uh, preferably or such as uh, can get you in trouble. And then when you're looking at uh, numerical claim ranges, we have a slide later, but things like effective amount uh, might end up, uh, you know, and, and uh, when it comes to functional uh, claim language, I think that uh, Gene's going to cover that, so I won't mention anything with respect to that. And then, um, honestly, our solution will detect all those, but also uh, looking for things like, uh, you know, terms that may impact uh, claim breadth and scope or, uh, you know, absolute terms, you know, uh, for example, like consisting essentially of, which is obviously a transitional phrase, but there's a lot of others that we detect. And then when it comes to absolute terms, you know, if you have something like essential, uh, necessarily need, require, uh, superior uh, within your claim set, uh, that may come back and haunt you as well. Um, now, with respect to the disadvantages, there's a lot, and I'm not going to repeat the ones there. I will add a few more, though. Uh, one of the things that oftentimes is overlooked is, you know, so what if we have a 112? You know, if we can address it during examination or during a prosecution, that's great. Well, as I mentioned before, sometimes it doesn't get brought up by an examiner, so you may have a fatal 112 issue that's not uh, addressed during prosecution. The other thing is, is it can delay receipt of a notice of allowance. So, you know, if you get a solo 112 rejection, you know, you, you just missed out on getting a notice of allowance, and, and uh, so that delays, you know, uh, you know, monetization of your patent. And then the other thing I would mention is, you know, it, it could be a situation where, you know, the examiner already has conducted a prior art search, and maybe they didn't find any really, really good uh, references, no, no, maybe no 102 references, maybe some 103 reference that, that, uh, references that could be combined. Um, and maybe in one of those references, there's a, you know, a teaching away from combination or teaching away. Um, you know, that sort of thing. So what I would say is that uh, when it comes to, um, um, you know, having outstanding 112 issues present, 
if the examiner has to go out with an office action to address those 112s, and why not go ahead and, and piece together, you know, maybe a three or, or four reference 103, they've already done the work, throw that in there, and maybe it sticks. Maybe there's something in there that, that the uh, applicant's representative uh, can latch on to as no motiv motivation to combine or teaching away. But at the end of the day, you may have just compounded your problems. Uh, you, you might have ended up having a notice of allowance, and now you've got 112 rejections and 103 rejections to deal with. The other thing would be opening the door for prosecution history estoppel. So if you have, uh, you know, narrowing amendments and corresponding arguments, arguments made to overcome 112 rejections during prosecution, obviously that might come back and haunt you uh, during litigation. And then, you know, at the end of the day, like I talked about, just having a weaker, less defensible patent. So uh, those are some of the ramifications of 112s and, and, and whatnot. So. Okay. And we've got slides coming up for um, much of this, particularly the language issues that you mentioned about about and substantially and, and aesthetically pleasing. So we're going to get to all of that with uh, cases here in a minute. Um, what I, what I want to just at least very quickly mention, um, we have two slides here. We're not going to spend really much time on them. I just, whenever we talk about 112, I always like to include these just as an FYI because some some people don't know it or some people are surprised by it. but the Patent Office does not follow the Supreme Court's Nautilus decision with respect to 112. What they do is they follow In re Packard, and this was uh, definitively explained last August in Ex parte McWard, where the Patent Office said that there's, in their view of the world, there's nothing in the Nautilus decision that requires them to use that particular test for determining indefiniteness since that was dealing with litigation. Now, this specific issue is percolating its way up to the Federal Circuit, so here in due time we will know whether or not the Patent Office does need to follow Nautilus or whether they can continue to do things in their own way. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a whole lot of nothing, um, but it is a different formulation of the indefiniteness test. And, um, you know, so you just want to be aware of that, um, where that's coming from. Now, well, Gene, I would say it's not a whole so, lot of nothing, even though it's, uh, you know, the words, reasonable certainty versus clarity, they sound like they could be the same thing. They're, they're really not because in the PTO you can still amend and you've got the broadest reasonable interpretation. And so you can certainly get into more 112 problems at the PTO than in uh, in court. Yeah, and that's the way, you know, so the PTO does typically uh, apply a more restrictive test, and they view Packard as being more restrictive, uh, although when you actually look at the language, it's not necessarily apparent unless you know how they're actually applying it, I suppose, correct? That's right. Yeah, so you just all need to be just, just cognizant of that. A decision will be coming out on that uh, soon, I believe, certainly within the next six months to a year. Uh, now, means plus function. Now, this is where we're going to spend a, a, a number of um, uh, slides here discussing means plus function, and I have a link here to a primer that I, I wrote on, on this topic, and on this slide we just have the statute. but. Um, Jim, after promising you I would do so, I forgot to include a slide on Donaldson, and I know that's a case near and dear to your heart. Can you tell us why, and can you tell us a little bit about Donaldson? <laughs> sure. Um, so this is a pretty old case. Uh, from It was decided in 1994, it's near and dear to my heart because I represented the PTO in that case, and that was the, the decision where the Federal Circuit required the PTO to start examining the disclosed means and equivalents. Um, it was, they, they went en banc to, re, to reverse the prior decisions that said the Federal Circuit could interpret means plus function claims as covering any means and didn't have to look at the specification for the disclosed means. And then they also looked at whether the uh, the means that were in the prior art then were equivalent to the disclosed means, um, and, and and they were not. So that's why it's near and dear to my heart for that case. Yeah, and that really, I think, without over-exaggerating it, I mean, and I believe this even before I knew that you were the one who argued it, 
that's sort of the beginning of modern means plus function uh, case law, correct? It, it woke up a lot of people to uh, to means plus function claims and the fact that they are actually somewhat narrow claims and not as broad as they might appear on their face. Right. Okay. So then we progress into, you know, over the last few years, this slide says, you know, historically the patent office would not interpret a claim to be invoking means plus function treatment unless you actually use the word means. It was very rare for them to do that. Um, and then enter uh, Williamson in 2015, where that changed because they said, you know, and they, they had been sort of leading up to this, and some of the cases had said, you know, we're not applying form over substance, but Williamson was really that first case where people again woke up and said, wait a minute, we might be get, getting tagged with 112F when we never used the word means and never thought we were in, in that ballpark, right, right, Jim? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's easier than ever now, after Williamson, to accidentally have a means plus function claim. Now, everybody knows if you say means for doing something, you're probably going to get means plus function uh, treatment. But uh, if you have other things that are somewhere in between, like uh, a member for or a means configured to, uh, you you may get means plus function treatment there as well. And I think for us practitioners, when we write patent applications, we need to decide, do we want means plus function treatment or not? And if we do, we should say means for. And if we don't, we shouldn't use the word means, and we probably shouldn't use the word for either. Yeah. yeah. And we have another slide here, and this, this talks about, um, I, I believe, th 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 is, this is your slide, I think, Jim, right? I think we worked on this. Based on what, what you were just saying. Right. We worked on this together, and uh -huh. there are some, uh, some words that, you know, have been found in certain circumstances to uh, invoke the means plus function treatment or not. And just so everyone understands, when you invoke the means plus function treatment, that means that your claim is limited to the means for performing the function that is disclosed in your specification and equivalence. And this list that's shown on the, the uh, slide right now has, an, has two of them that can be compared in a really interesting way. In the top paragraph where it says member four, that's been found to invoke means plus function treatment. In the second paragraph, there is, in the last uh, example, eyeglass hanger member that has been found not to invoke means plus function treatment. But imagine a claim that says a member for hanging eyeglasses, and then compare that to eyeglass hanger member. It's like. Wow, that's a really fine line between uh, whether you're going to get means plus function claim treatment or not. And that's why I say it's better to stay clearly on one side by saying means for, or clearly on the other side by uh, not using the word for, not using the word uh, means, and uh, preferably not using what they call a nonce word like member which can substitute in for just the word means because it doesn't really say anything. Yeah, yeah, and we have um, the next slide here. Oops, did, did I... uh, Gene, uh, Gene, if you if you don't mind, could I just put in a plug? Um, sure, it, it, sure. I just wanted to say for the audience that uh, a lot of these terms are actually mentioned and discussed in MPEP uh, 2181, uh, but there's a really good USPTO supplementary uh, examination guidelines uh, for 112 uh, that is uh, that, that covers a lot of these different uh, terminologies that, that may invoke, you know, uh, means plus function uh, treatment under 112F or, or 112.6 paragraph. Uh, but another thing too, uh, you know, means uh, means for, but also step for as well uh, for, you know, like chemical processes and that sort of thing. Also Federal Register Volume 76, uh, number 27, uh, has some great information uh, regarding uh, functional claim language as well. Yeah. And yeah. you know, Gene, I, mean, I should have 
explained also, sorry, um, with the uh, eyeglass hanger member uh, that was found in the all site case to be not means plus function. Um, the, the reason was that there were other claim limitations that talked about what that the member of that structure was. Otherwise, probably just eyeglass hanger member by itself could have triggered the uh, means plus function treatment. Yeah. Now I want to get to this, you know, next slide here because you know, one of the one of the things that as we talk about all the limitations on means plus function, it, it leads a lot of people to think, well, I just shouldn't be using means plus function claims. Period. The end. I personally think that's a that's a mistake. I mean, how often has anyone on this call ever been told, or if we have you know some corporate people, how many times have you ever told your patent attorneys? Um, Get me every single claim you can possibly write, every combination that you can think of I'm willing to pay for. And the answer is never. I mean, that never never happens. You know, you'd be getting thousands of claims even for simple inventions, really, if you were doing that. And nobody can really afford that. So the one thing that means does do is that it captures everything that's disclosed in the spec. Um, so I always tell people, don't ignore means claims but treat them like a very, very powerful garlic. You know, a little bit's gonna get you a long way. So when you're cooking, you don't wanna over garlic the food, but a little bit is okay. And I think the same thing is true with means claims. Now, of course, if you're gonna be using means claims when you're talking about software, you gotta remember the algorithm cases. And the algorithm cases are the ones that say that if 100% of the algorithm is not disclosed, then it does not matter what somebody of skill in the art would understand it is not covered in the means claim. And then that can become very problematic for a variety of reasons. One, it's not covered. Two, the claim is invalid. Um, so if you are gonna use means claims, you probably wanna, uh, and you're doing software, you gotta know about the algorithm cases. And um, my philosophy is, is you know, if you're doing software, you probably ought to be filing applica uh, applications where the specification would satisfy the algorithm cases anyway. I mean, we have heightened disclosure requirements for software. Uh, Jim, I, I know you have some thoughts on that too. Yeah, that's right. I, I think means plus function claims can be useful and uh, perhaps it's a, it's a good exercise to, uh, to make sure that you have disclosed algorithms uh, describing how to perform all of the functions because you're going to want that uh, anyway to support uh, other claims as well. Yes, yeah. So, all right, let me check the time. We're doing okay on time, but I want to push through, guys. Uh, and, and Jim, I think you may have covered this uh, already, but this was sort of your don't go halfway. You want to wrap that up for us? Yeah, I got ahead of ahead of ourselves there, but um, right. If 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 we're going halfway, you get the the worst of both worlds. If you have a hybrid claim that says not quite means for, but say a module for or means configured to, uh, under the broadest reasonable interpretation, which Donaldson said the PTO will apply, the PTO might not apply. Uh, means plus function treatment to a hybrid claim and will examine it as if it was very broad and yet in court uh, where you don't get the broadest reasonable interpretation, it might be interpreted more uh, in a more limited way as a means plus function uh, claim, in which case you've had to get over the hurdle of a broad claim in the PTO and yet all you've achieved for enforcement is a narrow claim, possibly. So that's that's the root of the the reason not to go halfway on means plus function claiming. And Gene, if, if you don't mind, can I add something about going halfway? Um, sure. Thank you, I appreciate that. So uh, when I first uh, heard going halfway, the first thing that jumped in my mind was, you know, having functional claim language, but not having support in the spec for a structure that accomplishes uh, that functional claim language. And I, I don't want to make this a, a, a product-focused uh, 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 webinar, but I do want to mention that we do have a thesaurus feature uh, that enables patent practitioners to, to type in, you know, attachment means, for example. And what we uh, enable the patent practitioner to do is get access to the uh, up to 10,000 
uh, patent documents in the entire U.S. WIPO European and Canadian patent corpus, uh, but that will provide them with uh, examples of structural variants that were, will accomplish whatever uh, functional uh, clause they put into the solution. And what's great about that too is that you can actually link down into a specific reference and see how that particular applicant defined uh, the, the functional clause within their spec, as, as, as well as, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the specific uh, structural variants included within that. So, you know, that comes into, into uh, great use when you're drafting because you can get a, a good sense of uh, maybe other variants to include within your own application that you may not have other, uh, otherwise thought of. So, you know, going, going halfway is definitely an issue and you want to go all the way to make sure you have support within your spec for, for that uh, structural variance. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate no, it. And, and, it's, and it's just, and somebody did mention this in, uh, in a question, it's not just what's in the spec, it's also the equivalence. So you get a little bit more, but sure. um, you know, you, you want to make sure you, you have the greatest support there that you possibly can. And I exactly. and personally, I just think, you know, that where the Federal Circuit is going with the disclosure requirements, they're always requiring more and more and more and more. You know, so we got to figure out ways to do that, and that's a different webinar for a different day, I suppose, uh, when we talk more about drafting um, and how you do that. But you have to keep that in mind when you're dealing with 112F. Jim, you want to say something? Oh, um, right, and uh, the a thesaurus might be very handy in uh, drafting a patent application to support a means plus function uh, claim or any other kind of claim because it's always better to disclose as many alternatives uh, uh, as possible for achieving the invention. Um, because if you have a means plus function claim, obviously it's a disclosed means and equivalence, and if you've got more disclosed means, then it ends up being a broader claim. No doubt. All right, next slide, and then this is going to be, uh, I think this starts to pivot us into away from means plus function. And uh, I know both of you, the profanity is a big issue that both of you talk about a lot. Uh, Jim, let's start with, with you since this specific list comes from you, and it relates to, to business methods. Uh, you want to explain what we're talking about here? Sure, absolutely. And I can't take credit for the graphic. Gene put that in there. It's a beautiful graphic. <laughs> so the, this is a list of words that I put together to uh, not have in your specification if we are trying to avoid uh, classification in a business method art unit. And uh, you know, it's, off, it's long been thought that the classification would be done by a human looking at the claims and uh, the title and perhaps um, the first portion of the specification and perhaps a drawing. Um, but the PTO is moving more and more towards uh, computerized analysis of patent applications. They're, they have, for the examiners, a search tool called PLUS, P-L-U-S. The L stands for linguistics. It doesn't look for meaning, it looks for words. And so if a patent specification has these businessy sounding words in it, um, the computer's gonna, gonna pick that up and flag it for classification purposes, even if none of these things appear in a claim or the title or a drawing. And so these things, these patent uh, profanities, the business method profanities should, if at all possible, not be used in the specification. These linguistics programs are pretty interesting. They look for how often a word appears also, not just what words appear. And so if you had to use one of these words, it'd be a good idea not to use it more than once. Yeah. Now, Dave, you um, you talk about profanity in general and not always specifically dealing with business methods. Um, your thoughts on words to avoid? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit earlier, Gene, and, and covered uh, many of those uh, in those different categories uh, that I mentioned earlier. But, you know, again, uh, just as a recap, you know, going through some of those like relative terminology, you know, terms of degree, approximations, uh, subjective terms, adjectives, exemplary claim language, uh, you know, numerical ranges like we'll get into here shortly, uh, as well as uh, functional, you know, functional language in and of itself isn't bad as long as you have supporting structure in the spec. 
you know, and then obviously uh, something that's a little bit out of, of 112, but is definitely applicable is, uh, uh, you know, uh, claim terms and phrases that may impact claim breadth sco and scope as well as, you know, absolute terminology and that sort of thing. So uh, something that's thought of a little less is public, uh, you know, terms that might invoke public relations concerns uh, or considered offensive. But I think the terms uh, that I mentioned earlier is, is a good overview of the different uh, things you should try to avoid. Yeah, and, got, and that's a nice pivot because now we, we're going to get into um, negative limitations in relational language specifically. And we start here with, with you know, negative limitations. And, um, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with, with negative limitations. And sometimes they, they can be, be useful. Um, but, and, there, and there's no necessarily heightened description requirement in order to use a negative limitation, you just have to kind of use it uh, properly. And the next slide that we have here comes from a case uh, that, Jim, you were involved in. Do you want to tell us uh, what, what you did here with respect to a negative limitation in order to get the issued patent? Jim, you might be on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I was. No I was saying wonderful things to myself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that... Uh, that claim that's up on the screen uh, has the word only in red, and so that could be seen as a negative limitation. Uh, in general, um, it, putting in a negative limitation in an amendment can be a great way to overcome a uh, prior art rejection because you can either carve out exactly what the prior art has, or you can uh, take away the examiner's motivation to combine. Say an examiner says you'd combine these references because it'll accomplish X. And if your invention doesn't do that, you can put in your claim you know, without accomplishing X. And then it's really hard for the examiner to, uh, to, uh, to stay with that rejection. This whole area of negative limitation stems from an old TCPA case called In Ray Johnson, and that still remains as a, as a great example. The, uh, the claims in there uh, had what's called a proviso. They added by amendment this proviso that certain elements in the claim can't be A, B, or C. And uh, the uh, the court said that was fine, and the quote that's interesting is that it says, appellants are merely excising the invention of another, not claiming new matter. And so they were allowed to excise, to carve out the prior art, and and then have everything else to themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Jim. And in fact, I, I leveraged that case uh, back in the day when I used to, to prepare and, and prosecute applications. And uh, one of the things that I always uh, refer to from the N. Ray Johnson case is the specification uh, having described the whole necessarily describe the part remaining. And one of the things that uh, patent practitioners will oftentimes run into is when they're trying to carve out, you know, to overcome a, you know, a 102 or 103 rejection, um, oftentimes what examiners will then do is, is uh, uh, come back with a 112 first lack of sufficient written description rejection. And uh, obviously, you know, if you've described it in your spec, you're permitted to uh, exclude that uh, from the scope of your invention. Obviously, if you have, uh, you know, a chemical invention, uh, if it's a tremendously large genus, um, you may get a 112, but, you know, it always helps if you have uh, some specific examples within your application of specific compounds. Um, and, you know, obviously at the end of the day, uh, if you, uh, you know, carve out, uh, you know, a point of, um, you know, uh, modification, you know, maybe there's a, a moiety that's present. Um, if you carve out a, a specific, uh, you know, functional group, uh, you know, the examiner has to come back and say, well, you, you know, one of ordinary skill in the art would be motivated to uh, add on or, or uh, modify that functional group to arrive at what your uh, remaining uh, invention is. And oftentimes that's not going to be present within the cited reference. And so it's a great way, as Jim had mentioned, to, to you know, overcome those 102s and 103s and, um, you know, leverage uh, N. Ray Johnson if you get a 112 first uh, rejection after including that exclusionary proviso within your claim. Yeah. Absolutely, Dave. And that brings up... Go ahead. That brings up the importance of the word may, because if your specification says it, your invention may have A, and it may have B, and it may have C, 
uh, then you've probably disclosed you know each of these things with and without a b mm -hmm. and c but if you said it does have a b and c then you might get this uh, uh rejection that that dave mentioned where you don't have support for having only a or only b or only c yeah and great it, point that brings up the point where you got to be very careful that you're actually saying what you mean to say and um, the, one of the things that I just wanted to say quickly about negative limitations, now re recall what we're not saying here is, is that you can in a claim describe, describe what the invention is not. Um, what we're talking about here is more subtle than that. Because if you say, oh, well, um, it's, it's, it's not this, it's not planar. Well, then what is it? Well, tell me, you gotta tell me what it is. So, the way we're talking about negative limitations here is a little bit more subtle than that. So I just want to make sure everybody understands um, the context here. So it's not per se bad, but you just, like everything else, you got to do it in the right way. Um, the next slide that we have here deals with relational language and, you know, the words like, type, similar. They, they just don't convey the type of certainty you need in claims, whereas uh, substantially, for example, can. It can certainly, and you see the word substantially come up uh, all, all the time in, in patents. Um, so that's one of the things we're going to talk about here. Um, and the next slide is uh, Berkheimer, again, uh, has an, a very interesting uh, piece to it that those of us who are focusing on the software eligibility component may have missed. Jim? Sure. Um, so the Federal Circuit found the phrase minimal redundancy was indefinite, but they approved, arguably, claim one that says without substantial redundancy. And at first glance, it can seem like, well, how is minimal redundancy any different than without substantial redundancy? Uh, but I think the uh, the uh, explanation probably lies in the word substantial. It has such a long history of being approved by courts as a uh, as a, a word of approximation. Um, when I was on the board, we had an expanded panel for a design claim where it, the issue was, could you say substantially as shown and described for your design claim? And that was controversial, but we, we held that, that you could have that. And we looked at all of the, the use of the word substantial throughout history, and it's, it's uh, very often been a, an approved type of relational word. Yeah, and that's this next case here is, those of you who are familiar with Bunch of Balloons, you may see it in Costco. Uh, it's, you can uh, hook up this thing to a, your, your hose bib or a hose, and it will fill up a 100 water balloons all at the same time. It actually works, it's great, kids love it. Um, and full disclosure, I'm friends with the guy who invented it, but uh, it's a wonderful invention. And this has been litigated, and they use the term substantially filled, and Telebrand said, oh, well, no, that's indefinite, we don't know what substantially filled means. And the Federal Circuit wrote that, you know, the admission had been made that the person of skill in the art had at least an associate's degree in science or engineering, and the Federal Circuit said, we're pretty sure that that person would know what substantially filled means because the way it was discussed in the specification was once it is substantially filled, they actually fall off the device and it becomes, the balloons become sealed. So substantial, and also in this case, and if you listen to the oral argument, um, the Federal Circuit was pretty incredulous because they thought, to some extent, Telebrands was trying to argue that the word substantially in and of itself is indefinite. And they're like, there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, patents that use the word substantially, and they were not going to go that far. So I think you're in safe ground, as Jim was saying, when you're using the word substantially. But of course, if it's unclear what substantially means from the specification, that doesn't mean that you, you can't have problems. You, we just tend to use it, we know it, we define it well enough, and, it, and, it's, and it's a safe harbor word, I, I would personally say. Yeah, I think if you have the support in the spec, and then, you know, if it comes up during uh, prosecution, obviously, when construing the claim term meetings, they're going to look not only to the spec, but also the, the prosecution history. And 
uh, at the end of the day, it's one of those things where do you want to include substantial into your claims because you're kind of, you know, it is it is a safe harbor if you have sufficient written description or you've clearly defined it in the prosecution history. But, you know, t talking to what Jim had mentioned, there's just a ton of cases out there, uh, you know, granted patents as well as uh, litigated uh, cases. And so it's one of those things where, you know, uh, do, you, do you want to put yourself uh, – uh, on the line for for having to litigate what you meant by substantial. Maybe you're fine with that if you've got clear support, but if you don't, obviously it might be an issue. And there's a ton of uh, there's a lot of cases: substantial absence, substantial portions, substantially equal, substantially uh, pure, and substantially interfering. There's there's cases on all that. So just something to be mindful of. Uh, like you said, you know, Gene, if, if you're going to use it, make sure you define it clearly. Yeah, and because defining things really saves a lot. Now I just skipped past the about slides simply because I think we're running a little bit close to on time and we wanted to I want to make sure we get to uh, subjective terms here um, which because um, I think both Dave and Jim have already mentioned aesthetics and you know is, is it aesthetically pleasing well aesthetically pleasing the the courts have said well what essentially they didn't say this in the case but the, essentially have said Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. What one person might think is aesthetically pleasing is not what another person might think is aesthetically pleasing. Now, having said that, uh, look and feel comes up in DDR holdings, and in DDR they say, well, look and feel has a very pretty specific meaning, you know, um, when, and therefore that was not problematic. Um, and it really all becomes what somebody of skill in the art would understand by using the term. And are you using it um, in a concrete way? Is it descriptive or not? Aesthetically pleasing, not descriptive enough because it's it's too subjective. Look and feel, um, and I tried to figure out how he was gonna say this, you know, because we talk about look and feel, and maybe it's because the concept for IP attorneys is familiar from the trademark space. We know what is being meant by look and feel. It has a meaning. Uh, Jim, any thoughts on this? I think you might be on mute again. Well, another difference uh, with the, the two cases between aesthetically pleasing and look and feel is the pleasing part. Uh, we perhaps can say, well, how does it, how does it look? But it, it's a little bit more subjective to say, is it pleasing? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, we have a question specifically about food products um, in relative terms. What should you do when writing patents directed to food products? Um, I don't necessarily have any specific experience in that. I know uh, Todd Van Tolme, who was on the webinar that we did also with Lexus in November, that's exactly the area he works in. Um, and you might want to look that webinar up on IP Watchdog where you can uh, listen to it again because we did specifically talk about food products in that webinar. Uh, do either of you guys have any experience with food products or? Uh, Jim? Or, or uh, I can comment. Uh, if, uh, yeah, either way. I, I only have experience eating food products. Yeah, me, me too <laughs> is, is probably evident from my picture, I, but Dave, go ahead. Uh, you know, I was going to say, uh, back in the day I was in Group R Unit 1616 and so I, I examined uh, bio-affecting, bio-treating uh, compounds, compositions, uh, methods of making, methods of using. So uh, my, my docket did eventually focus primarily on, on insecticides, pesticides, but I did examine some uh, food-related uh, applications. And my, my I guess my comment would be uh, when it comes to claim terminology, uh, I would stick with the, the claim terms, but then maybe use your spec uh, as a way to uh, exemplify, you know, uh, desirable results or uh, superior results. And if you can, uh, if you can provide some, uh, you know, evidence, uh, hopefully in the spec or maybe in a 132 deck, but uh, showing that, you know, when you have these, uh, when you have these specific components and these specific ranges. Uh, you get, you know, um, you know, aesthetically or not aesthetically pleasing, but uh, pleasing uh, flavors or, or what have you. So, uh, you know, this this composition tastes much better than the other one, or something to that effect. But I would say uh, leave that out of the out of the claims and, and rely on your examples and your uh, specification to kind of demonstrate that uh, you know the subjective terminology to, to give it weight um, for, for you know for your claims. Yeah. Okay, we got. 
down to the last five minutes, so let's push ahead and see. We, I think we will be able to get all the way through because this is the last substantive slide, and it deals with uh, numerical ranges and, and uh, you know, amount limitations. And remember the term up to includes zero. Um, you know, that's something that tricks up a lot of particularly younger folks and new to the new to the industry. And then the phrase an effective amount. You know, well, what is an effective amount? I mean, it can be okay, it may not be okay. Again, that's one of those real uh, words that you got to, if you're going to use it, you got to make sure you've defined it. Gentlemen, any any thoughts on this before we, we close out here? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, in, in addition to numerical uh, claim ranges, I would definitely refer to 2173.05c in the uh, MPEP, and it talks about uh, a couple of things that I mentioned is using uh, claim language where you have a specific range and then, uh, you know, such as or for example or preferably uh, within the same claim. Obviously, you can add those further limitations in a dependent claim, but if you have that in a single claim, you're going to get slammed at the 112 uh, second. And then uh, the other thing would be like, you know, kind of like what you're talking about, uh, Gene, with the up to, uh, that's obviously uh, been litigated in the past or, or not more than uh, uh, things like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Jim, go ahead. Well, this is an area where you might get past the patent office because you might not notice your uh, your problem in the uh, in the claim, and the patent office might not notice the problem in the claim, but then, as Dave mentioned, it might get litigated in district court. And that applies generally to 112 problems, that uh, it's not just whether you can get the patent past the patent office, because then in litigation, if you have a 112 problem, you know, at worst, uh, it means that your whole patent is invalid, but at best, uh, it means that you're going to have to go back to the PTO and fix it in a certificate of correction or a reissue application. And that not only delays your litigation, but it may also introduce intervening rights where the patent holder loses all of the uh, the past damages, and so uh, these kinds of latent problems are important to uh, to identify going in to do it right the first time. Yeah, and I wanted to add uh, just a moment ago. I, I I didn't want to interrupt, but I would say that uh, there there's a great primer uh, that you can access uh, through the USPTO or over the internet. Uh, dealing with examination of ranges, and that was uh, authored by Jean Witz. Uh, she is a supervisory patent uh, reexamination specialist, but it's got some great case law in there uh, regarding numerical claim ranges. I know we're running short, uh, but uh, I would definitely uh, recommend taking a look at that. Yeah, yeah. And now, I guess, you know, in the we, we've used up just about all the remaining time here. So, gentlemen, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give each of you in rapid fire, close out um, the the webinar fashion, mic drop, if you will. What do you want people to remember as they leave today? Uh, Dave, start with you, and then Jim, you'll have the final word. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is just uh, the fact that our solution, uh, Patent Optimizer, enables you to avoid uh, many, if not uh, all, of these 112-related uh, errors when analyzing your application, um, you know, uh, leveraging the solution. So you're, it's going to capture those 112s, and, you know, you're going to end up uh, being able to streamline uh, the patent prosecution process, avoid unnecessary 112 rejections, um, and that sort of thing. So uh, definitely, if you haven't looked at it, definitely take a look at it. Um, it uh, is great from both a uh, uh, patent prep and process uh, uh, perspective, but also from a litigation perspective if you're looking for those fatal 112s that, you know, uh, squeaks past the, the patent office that you'd like to leverage for, you know, potentially invalidating certain claims. And, Jim, your takeaway. Okay. Uh, obviously, my one of my issues is to get people to stop unnecessarily discussing prior art in their patent applications. And an area we didn't talk about is cover sheet provisionals prepared by somebody else and getting incorporated by reference into your application, then you're essentially restating everything that was in the cover sheet provisional that may or may not have been written uh, by a patent lawyer with patent law in mind. So it's not always a good idea to automatically incorporate those cover sheet provisionals by reference because of 112 and other issues. Right, yeah, and, and I guess my, my takeaway here is, um, is simply, 
you know, you want to know what's in your application. You want to define the terms that you're using to the greatest extent possible. And um, you, you just have to go into this, you know, eyes, eyes wide open. Because 112, I think, really is the linchpin of modern uh, patent practice um, for a variety of reasons. You know, if you have good 112 support, you're going to have an easier time on 101. If you have good 112 support, you're going to have all the stuff that you need to overcome the prior art that comes up that you didn't, didn't necessarily know about. So um, the specification is, it, it's a disclosure world. You know, it's a disclosure mm -hmm. revolution to some extent. Yeah, I think uh, the old adage, uh, garbage in, garbage out, Gene, you know, if you if you have a horribly written spec uh, at the beginning, you're going to have a tough go of it, whereas if you have a well-written spec with a lot of support, uh, it's going to make your life a lot easier, and your clients, uh, you know, it's going to save money for your clients as well. Yeah, yeah, um, I, th I, think, I think that that's right. So, um, uh, you know, Gene, really you introduced you introduced the, uh, the webinar by uh, talking about not just trying to get numbers of patents, but quality patents, and and I just want to emphasize that it's probably better to do it, take the time to do it right the first time on a fewer number of patents that are going to end up being valuable, instead of uh, getting commodity a, a number of commodity patents, none of which are going to be any good. Yeah, no, I I couldn't couldn't agree with that more. Spend more time and energy getting the things that matter, and that's probably a good place to leave it. Because uh, we're now over time. I really appreciate you all for being on the call, and I appreciate you guys uh, for being here as panelists and sharing your expertise. And if you do have any questions about uh, Patent Optimizer and you might be interested, you can contact uh, Maria, and there's her email and phone number. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we look forward to having you hopefully at, join us for another webinar in the future, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you much. It was a pleasure.